Hey, ambitious dentist, welcome to Start Your Dental Practice, the show for existing and aspiring dentists to take your dental practice to the highest possible level. I'm your host, Jonathan Van Horn, CPA and ABV, founder of DentistMetrics.com. In every episode, we aim to demystify the how to start a dental practice problem by bringing on world-class dentists, influencers, and consultants in the dental industry to pick their brain about how to get past the barriers involved from going from no practice to being a practice owner to owning your own successful dental practice. Today's show features Marilee Sears from MarileeSears.com, and you're going to hear more about her incredible journey in just a second. But before that, here are a few of the things you're going to want to stick around to hear about in today's interview. You're going to learn about how Marilee's father played a huge role in her becoming the systems person to dentists across the world. The thing that was said in front of dental students at a local event that infuriated the industry, industry sponsors and the problem posed by corporate dentistry having a presence in dental schools. And Marilee and I really kind of uh, unleash on this uh, because we both think it's a pretty weird problem. We're going to learn about why it's a good thing that the dental industry is highly competitive. You're going to learn about natural leadership as a dentist. Uh, you know, is it just natural? Is it a teachable skill, etc.? cetera? You're going to learn about the breakthrough moment that Marilee had that reshaped her career, business, and life. And you're also going to learn one of the biggest ways to get further as a dental practice owner and why this was the best investment Marilee and I have made. So Marilee has a show called and an event that she sponsors called the Future of Dentistry event. This event has 22 of the industry's biggest speakers. It has people like Scott Loon, Dr. Phelps. It has a lot of people in there that are really, really, really in tune with the industry. They know a lot about it. They work every day at the business of dentistry. And Marilee interviewed 22 of them and recorded all of these interviews. These interviews are high impact, high value, and she typically only allows people to have access to these for about 30 days after she does this this event. Uh, she does it once a year. However, she, as a bonus, has allowed us access to all 22 episodes. So for today's bonus, stay tuned to the end to learn how you can get free copy of all 22 episodes, all 22 interviews with dental, the dental industry's leading experts. Hello, Ambitious Dentist. Today I have with us Mary Lee Sears. Mary Lee is a coach for dentists and as well as the host of the Future of Dentistry event, which is a fantastic event that she runs uh, different times in, in the year. It is the last event that she did had 22 interviews with some of the most influential people in dentistry, and uh, Marilee also runs a a one-on-one coaching program as well as a group coaching program that's currently sold out, but we were lucky enough to be able to get connected with her at a time where she'd be able to give us some information about uh, some of the things that she's seeing in dentistry and really to show us a little bit more about how young dentists can be successful in today's business environment. So, Marilee, thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks so much for having me, Jonathan. I'm looking forward to talking to you. Well, we're really excited here, too. So uh, one thing I wanted to talk about is, is uh, Marilee has a really, really, really great uh, story, a really great message that brought her into dentistry. I feel like a lot of people that uh, do a really fantastic job in the dental industry have a very strong story behind them, and uh, Marilee is, is, is definitely one of those that the first time I heard it, I, I knew that, that that she she understood what is important for dental practice owners to, to, to uh, what they hold important, what they feel is, uh, you know, should be driving them. Uh, and Marilee, do you mind talking about your dad for a little bit? No, not one bit. I don't think I ever talk about dentistry without talking about my dad because, you know, really is the reason that I do what I do. It's interesting because so my dad was a dentist. He practiced in the same town for almost 50 years. And I'm the 10th of 11 kids. And so when people ask me how I got introduced to dentistry, I honestly will say sometimes it was, you know, it was kind of by force. 
because when I was 11 years old was when my dad offered me my first job in a dental office. He offered um, to have me start working as, his, as a sterilization assistant after school and in the summers, and, and then also cleaning the offices in the evening um, because his practice was really busy. I think he had seven operatories, you know, four or five assistants at different times, two or three people up front. He definitely had a really busy practice. And so um, I started, I, I had a pretty solid babysitting gig at the job at the time. And I was, I was totally happy with babysitting. Mm -hmm. And I remember one day that I was probably a couple days after my dad offered me this job as a civilization assistant, I'm at my babysitting job and I get a phone call, the, the house phone rings and it's my mom. And my mom just said, Marilee, is this what you want to do with your life? Do you just want to be a babysitter? And I was like, I, I I, I don't know if this is what I'm going to do with my life. My, I, I don't know. You know, and she's like, well, your dad has given you a great opportunity, and you're just going to let it go to waste. There's no future in babysitting. And I <laughs> still remember that because I remember even at that time thinking, this is a really strange conversation to have with an 11-year-old. <laughs> you know, and so I, I resigned my babysitting job at that point, and I started working in my dad's practice. And the truth is, um, I... Uh, over time, it did not happen immediately, but over time, I fell in love with dentistry. And um, I had taken actually a step back. Um, I became a hygienist. I really never had the desire to become a dentist. I was actually offered by, to join a couple different practices when I was a hygienist if I wanted to go to dental school because I've always really had great partnerships with dentists because since my dad was a dentist, I understood the numbers. I understood that... Um, you know, what I needed to do in order to pull my own weight as a hygienist. And I think that's oftentimes rare for hygienists to look at it and go, I'm here because I need to make money for the practice. First and foremost, I'm here because I want to provide well for the patients. But if I'm providing well for the patients, I'm going to make a profit for the practice. And that's the way I always looked at it when I was working hygiene. But then um, I took a step back from working hygiene and hygiene coaching when I had my second son. And that was in 2008. And then, um, so I hadn't really worked that much within a practice. And then, then in 2012, my dad was still working within dentistry. He was still practicing, even though he was well into his 70s. And he was diagnosed with leukemia in 2012. And coming into his practice, and because he just became too sick to work, coming into his practice, it gave me a whole new appreciation for the stresses and the pressures that dentists are under. Because... My dad worked so much growing up, and I always thought he was at the office so much because our house was so noisy with 11 kids. <laughs> and that might, have been a, that might have been a part of it. But the truth is I saw, oh, my goodness, there are so many different moving pieces within a practice. And if you don't know what's the most important, you can just constantly be having different balls in the air and feeling like you never have everything under control. And I think that's the way my dad practiced for almost a few years was just constantly with different things, pulling out his time, pulling out his attention. And, you know, without sounding too out there, it's just the honest truth that I feel my dad so close around me. He ended up passing away um, just late, late in 2012. And the entire time that he was sick and his health was declining, my focus was on his practice. And I, I can't talk about it without emotion because... If there's one thing I could, I wish I could change, it's that. It's that I wish I hadn't had to be so focused on his practice in a time that, you know, his time was really limited. But the thing that I kind of love is that I, I feel my dad go, you know, I feel this thing of, oh, I wish I would have been able to do that differently. I wish I would have had more time by my dad's side. But the truth is I feel him around me now, and I feel that same message from him of, like, Merrily, I just wish I would have known and I wish I would have practiced so differently. I wish there were family memories I wouldn't have missed out on. I wish I wouldn't have spent so much time in the office. I wish I wouldn't have been working so hard um, because the truth is he was working way harder than he needed to. And that right there is why I do what I do is because I don't want anyone else to have that regret that my dad died with. And that regret that I live with is I wish I would have done it differently. I wish that my practice wouldn't have taken all of my time. I wish that I could have set up a life that the way I wanted to. And the truth is, you know, starting up a practice especially takes time. You know, it does take your attention, but it shouldn't be that way for years and years and years. 
And that's the message that if there's one thing that your listeners can hear today is that, that, you know, know that it's going to take your time, it's going to take your attention, but it should get easier. And if it's not getting easier, then something's wrong. Fantastic message. Thank you for sharing that story. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the pain that you, you, that you went through and the, 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 the story that you, you share with your dad is something you hear about over and over and over again, and especially uh, from the, the, the planning side, from the more litigious planning side of taxes and uh, you know, estates and everything like that, wills, uh, disability, all of those things are so, so very important for, for the young dentist to, to get wrap their heads around because while your dad was in his 70s, uh, things also happen to, to younger people, unfortunately, and yes. that's, that's something that everyone really needs to, that's listening also needs to, to, to take into account is, you know, uh, it, it's never too late to start planning for uh, the worst to take care of the people that are around you. So, again, thank you for sharing that. that that's, a, that's a very powerful story, uh, and it, it, it really, I'm sure it really resonates with a lot of people that, um, you know, some, something... Uh, you have you have a pain that you're trying to help other people avoid, which is, is very I feel like is is a very powerful way to uh, be impacting other people. So um, let's let's talk a little bit about the um, the current business environment for dental practices. Uh, so you and I have spoke before about how uh, we uh, you know there, there's corporate dentists. There are corporate practices that are coming in, and actually, I had a conversation just a week ago with an instructor at a dental school that uh-huh. uh, he said that him and some colleagues had had a, a meeting at night with some of the dental students to, to kind of just you know temper their expectations about getting out of school, about you know how much they're worth, you know if they should be charged, they should be receiving you know eighty dollars an hour to one hundred and twenty dollars an hour. Uh, that you know they, that there are banks out there that are willing to lend to them if they're willing to you know start their own practice you know to be open to that avenue, and the instructor actually said that the next day they were called into the school's office and were told that they didn't they enjoyed the the presentation they liked them doing that but the school actually told them they didn't they never needed to do that again because of the fact that they. Um, that the sponsors of the school were not happy that the kids were being taught that information about how much they're actually worth. Um, oh, Jonathan! Oh my goodness, you're <laughs> going to get me on my soapbox here. Oh my goodness, I, yeah. I had, I believe it or not, I had a really funny, similar experience. But that that right there is what drives, me, and I think also um, that is what kind of pushed me into what I do with the future of dentistry event. Because I, as I said, in 2008, I kind of took a step back from dentistry when my second child was born. And up to that point, I had been doing hygiene coaching. So I've been traveling around the country. I really felt like, you know, I was attending a lot of conferences. I felt like I hadn't, I was uh, staying up to date with what was out there. And I'm just going to go ahead and admit that really from like 2009 to 2011, I, I just wasn't working hygiene. I was doing online PE. And I don't think I heard this message about how much corporate was influencing dentistry. And so in 2000, I guess it was uh, 2012 when I started going around to the dental schools and trying to uh, talk to dental students about the opportunity to come into my dad's practice and take over my dad's private practice, it totally shocked me when student after student was saying, oh, well, private practice is dead. You know, that's just not even an opportunity. That's not even, you know, that's, that's not even something that we're going to be looking at because that's not a profitable model anymore. And I was like, what? Who have you been talking to? Like, it was such a shock to me. And um, that's exactly how I got started was because over and over again, these students were getting the message that that model is dead. You can't do that anymore. And I was saying, no, that's not true. There are dentists who are still doing very well in private practice. And there's, that opportunity is absolutely available. That's the reason that you went to dental school is because you wanted to own your own business. Don't let anybody tell you that that's not an option because it's a very viable option. You just have to be a little bit smarter about it and a little bit more discerning that maybe it, than they had to be in the past. And, you know, just like th- that instructor had all these students that were really interested in that, I started getting emails from these students saying, okay, really, are you sure, you know, wanting to talk to more or less um, – wanting to pick my brain about it. And I just said, listen, I'm really busy trying to take care of my dad's practice right now. 
but I promise that, you know, I'll come back to the school, I'll do a presentation because I'm telling you, I know dentists, I'm in communication with them that are doing really, really well right now. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you. I don't think that, whether it's intentional or not, and I'm choosing to believe at this point that it's not intentional, that's just my own choice, there is a very heavy influence in dental schools because their biggest sponsors tend to be um, GSOs and cor you know corporate entities that are letting students, really pushing dental students towards corporate dentistry. And to me, that's, that's really sad. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it, it, it's very, very valuable right now for, for practices to take over an existing practice or to even start their own practice. Even, you know, there's um, somewhat of a stigma around starting a practice in, in some of the circles that I've been in. Uh, and they said, you know, why would you ever start your own practice and, you know, have to deal with the, the, the growth uh, rather than just taking over a practice that already has cash flow? Uh, and they say, that, you know, they quote that the, um, the failure rate on startups is higher than it is on acquisitions. And to be honest with you, the you know the the failure rate on acquisitions is like 0.5 of or is like half of one percent uh, of acquisitions fail, and, and that's not because of the fact that um, the, um, uh, the the dentist didn't know what they were doing or it was a bad buy or anything like that. It's typically just because of the fact that um, the, it's such a good business model that there's not many people fail at it. If you if you get in it and you work at it and you work hard at it. You can turn a lot of things around. Now, there's a huge difference in the practice that's struggling to meet, make ends meet. And when I say make ends meet, you know, paying off their student loan debt, paying off their, 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 their home debt, you know, providing for their family, providing for all the families of their employees, providing for all their patients. Uh, and the practice that is just, just thriving and all of those things that they're taking care of, they're t still taking care of all those things, but there's still a healthy income on the other end. Those are two different things, but there are plenty of opportunities in the, in the latter. There's plenty of ways to make those things happen in, in almost every place in the country. But the reason I, we talk about startups sometimes, a lot of the times here is that uh, in areas of growth, there's rarely a practice that's even there to be acquired. So in the areas of growth, those are the areas where you can actually start these practices that can do really, really well. Uh, and I'll be honest with you, um, you'll see corporate dentists, corporate practices doing the same thing. You'll see a corporate practice start mm -hmm. in a, a new area uh, because they want to be the first person in there. Uh, and if you are able to get there, the leg up on them, get there a little bit faster than them, get started there, that's actually um, a, a reason for them to stay away from that area for a little bit longer because there's gonna, they do look at the amount of competition in the area. So it's, it's, it's baffling to me that the schools are, and, you know, I, I, I don't want to be, you know, put on my, my, my tinfoil hat and, you know, talk about the Illuminati and conspiracy theories and all these other things. But, you know, it, it, there's definitely a, a, a piece of that. And, you know, from you were talking about speaking at schools. Uh, I was going to go speak at a school uh, recently, and they said I could host a lunch. I was like, sure, I'll go host a lunch. Uh, and when we, we got talking about doing it, they're like, okay, well, the uh, to, to, you, you pay for feeding the kids, fine. That's absolutely fine. I, I planned on doing that anyway. Doing, they didn't ask me to. I was going to feed the kids. Uh, and then they said, and for the, uh, you, you feed them. It's a 45-minute segment. Um, you know, in, whenever you, you'll, you'll, you'll go in, you'll give them the food, and then you can talk to them for 20 minutes or so, and then after that, you're done. And they said, and for that, it's like $2,000 to do that in addition to paying for the kids' food. And I was like, holy cow, like, I, that was my first experience with that. And so if any guys out there are in dental school, you know, you're getting those free lunches, realize that those people are paying a lot of money for you. Uh, but the, the, the reason that they do that is because they can charge that much. They can charge the big industries and big companies to do that. Um, and because of the fact that they do that, those companies will have influence because they want those spots to be filled. Uh, they are businesses after all. So... Yeah, go ahead. Jonathan, what you what you said there is so important and this is the word of this is um, one thing I would say to dental students out there is that for those that are in leadership and even those that try, quite honestly aren't in leadership, look for people that you want to learn from. Because that's one thing that has really been a benefit to me is that I've been invited to speak to to dental students and if the school won't open up the school 
won't, you know, allow me to come into one of their classrooms, then I'll just do it off-site. But it's always been invited by the students, and that has made a huge difference, at least um, because I don't feel like I'm going, I'll be honest, it's, it's kind of like I'm coming in the back door. And it, again, it wasn't intended this way, but I just was invited to be on a panel um, in 2013, I believe it was 2013, um, for a group of, it, it was a, a group of female dental students, there were about 80 of them that wanted to hear about the opportunities within dentistry. And so they had a panel of female dentists, and I was the only hygienist that was there. And the truth is, I didn't actually think, I, I thought I was just coming to listen to the panel. I wasn't expecting that I was invited to be on the panel um, just right as it was opening up. And that right there was, it was such a great conversation to have with the students because it ended up being that conversation of, are there opportunities outside of going into corporations? And so I would say that for the students, don't think this is going to sound bad, and again, kind of conspiracy theory. Don't think that the school is inviting people that are, have your best interests at heart. I would, I know you're busy with school, but look at those people, those leaders that you really, um, you like their message or that you just feel, you feel like they have your, you know, you connect with them. I, I really believe in knowing who you're supposed to work with and knowing who has, you can feel when people have your best interests at heart. Mm -hmm. Invite them to the school. Invite them, you know, something like this where just share, share interviews and invite them just to do an audio interview and share it with your classmates. Because the great thing is that um, the world has gotten so small, you might not be able to have someone come to your dental school, but that doesn't mean you can't talk to them and share their information with your fellow students really, really easily. And you're absolutely right that there definitely is like a, a monetizing of dental students nowadays, which I don't think was there even maybe five or ten years ago. That it. The dental schools really, I think, are struggling, and so they're looking for all these different ways because they can make money in these different ways. They're all looking to maximize their profit in these different ways. Right. And, you know, the, the other part about that is that given that they are, you know, a business and, and, and typically, you know, they're, they're in, they're, they're in the, the school's interest is to create great dentists that can, you know, go out and, and, and serve the, the public. But at the same time, there is there are people that are running those organizations that, you know, they have some, some, some standards that they have to meet. They have some goals they have to meet. And sometimes that, they have, that part of that is revenue. And that is where this, this kind of comes into play. Another avenue of that is that, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll have more students. They'll host more students, which if they have more students, that means there's going to be more people coming out that are walking out of dental school with dental degrees that are going to be, you know, at some point, uh, you know, expanding the, the number of practices that are out there, which, uh, as you know, as everybody knows, the retirement age is, 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 is getting older and older and older. As the retirement age gets older, that means that there's less practices that are becoming available. So there's more competition for the practices that do become available. And at the same time, there's more people, there's more people serving uh, uh, patients out there. So you add in the corporate dentistry and everything like that, and it gets more and more competitive. Uh, and that's not a bad thing. I talk about it quite a bit on the podcast. It's not bad that we're in a competitive a business industry because if we were not in a competitive industry, then you should be very worried because that would mean that it's not a very good business. Um, it, because of the fact that it is competitive, you know that it is a very good industry for you to be in. Uh, these people wouldn't be spending, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in trying to uh, create these giant corporate chains if it was a fantastic business model. So. Be, ha, have that be a little bit of a, 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 a reassurance that you're in the right industry, that you're going to be able to do well. Uh, and the reason that you can do well is because in these corporate practices, they're not, it's kind of like the, the, the David and Goliath, uh, you know, a, a analogy that, you know, the Goliath is, is, a, is a giant thing that can't move very fast. And he gets taken down by David who has, uh, you know, just, just a sling and a rock because he's very nimble, he can make something happen quickly. Uh, you, as a private practice owner, or David in, the, in this situation, very, very possible for you to take down Goliath. You just have to have some wits about you. You have to be smart about it. And you have to have people behind you that make a really good team. Uh, so moving on from, from, the, from talking about the corporate practices and things like that, and you know, keeping an analogy of the, the David and Goliath, um, one of the really important things about that analogy that I really like as well is that, you know, David becomes, comes on to become um, a very uh, influential character. 
uh, he's a very influential, influential person. Uh, and so he uh, has great leadership about him. I feel that the defining factor of every very, very successful dentist, we're talking about the two parallels, or the two, the two types of dentists that come out and they say that, you know, there is a, um, the, the thriving dentist versus the dentist that's getting by. Uh, I always feel like the ones that are just thriving are really, really great leaders. And I know, Marilee, a lot of your coaching focuses on becoming a great leader. So talk to me a little bit about what you see in young dentists today and where uh, and, and how they can become better leaders if they weren't born a great leader. Well, I'll, I'll start by saying really nobody's born a great leader. I, I will say that, but the truth is there are people who are naturally more talented. I can look at my two kids. I'm kind of whispering so that they don't hear me as I'm saying this. <laughs> but I can look at my two kids and just, I mean, we raised them in the same way. We did their same things. And one of my kids truthfully just has a little bit more perseverance. And I'll be honest, I think he has more confidence. And he happens to be my younger son. And so he's a natural leader. And that right there is, there's so many things that actually go into leadership, but a big part of it is confidence and a big part of it is perseverance. And the reason why I really talk so much about leadership is because I'm, I seem a pretty happy, positive person. My life was going just, you know, just fine before I took over my dad's practice. So what happened is, you know, he could no longer practice. I needed to come in and bring in a temporary dentist. And then when he passed away, we need to transition to practice within 12 months. And I'm sure anyone who's listening knows, this, you know, you need to make sure it's as profitable as possible when you're selling the practice because that's what influences how, how much the practice is sold for. So there was a lot of pressure at that time with my dad being sick, and that's why my, my focus went there. And so I, I'll just be honest, and I thought I was a pretty savvy business person as I went into my dad's practice. Um, I had done hygiene coaching up to that point. I understood the numbers of the practice. But coming in and actually having to manage and lead his team, communicate with patients, it helped me to see, and it was not a pretty, it was not a pretty smooth lesson, the gaps that I had in myself where there, I, there was a lot of situations that I would have liked to avoid. Um, I wasn't very confident in my communication with the team members. And because of that, things were really just falling apart left and right. And over the next, you know, 18 months of everything was transitioned, including selling the building, everything luckily just fell right into place. I think there was just miracle after miracle and blessing after blessing that happened. But one of the biggest blessings and miracles is that I was changed as a person, and I think I'll never be the same because of that experience, because it developed my capabilities as a leader. And now looking at that, I tell people that year and a half of transitioning my dad's practice was probably, it was probably worth a million dollars to me as far as the growth that happened in me personally during that time. It was the hardest thing I ever did, but it changed fundamentally who I was as a person. And it changed me in ways that I'm really really grateful for. And so when I see people running away from private practice or running away from a startup because they think that it's too big of a challenge, I want to say this. If you have that drive in you of this is what I want to do, there's no use to run away from it. Because I don't want to talk you into something that doesn't sound good to you. If you're like, it's just like me becoming a dentist. People could put whatever incentive in front of me that they wanted. They could say, you know what, we're going to pay you this much if you want to go ahead and go to dental school and join our practice. It just never spoke to me. I, I knew I was not meant to be a dentist. I knew that my profession was in dentistry, but I never for a moment thought, that's right, I'm supposed to be a dentist. I just knew it was something else. And so for those of you that are like, you know what, they're offering really good money, but this just isn't what I want to do, you have to listen to that and know that there – it is not going to happen without challenges, and it isn't going to happen without um, growth, but the opportunity for both personal growth and then also for a profit, you know, for benefiting financially from those decisions is huge. And for me, the two kind of go hand in hand. The more you grow as a person, the more you grow as a leader, the better the bottom line of your practice is. And so that's the thing I kind of like about it is that it. it forces you to look at your gaps and it forces you to look at the ways you need to develop yourself a little bit more because if your practice isn't growing, you have the black and white there and you're like, okay, I believe that every business problem, every practice problem 
is actually a personal problem that's been magnified, and now you can see in black and white. And I've yet to see someone who's a really strong communicator, that's a really effective leader, that yet month after month is going, I just can't figure out. I can't figure this out. I can't get my practice going. Because those are the people that they get, they, they kind of, it's easy for them to like blow off the training wheels in no time. Because essentially dentistry is still so much of a relationship business. Mm -hmm. And there's absolutely business principles that you need to understand and you need to be watching out for. And there's people that you need to surround yourself with. But the better you can be at a le as a leader and as a communicator and as a motivator um, with sharing your your vision and communicating that both to your team and to your patients, it, it really does pay off in the bottom line. It really does. And, you know, I am the most like pragmatic guy on the, on the, in the universe. Um, I have always been like real cut and dry and just, you know, this is the way it is. We can make things happen, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Very binary one. It's, a, it, it, it's either black or it's white. Uh, and I guess that's part of my profession. And I, this stuff for a lot, some people out there, they're going to think that that's kind of fluff, that they're not going to understand yeah. the importance of it. And from a person that has been on the other side of that fence, let me tell you, this stuff is, 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 is very, very real. Being, understanding where you are currently in your own situation uh, and being able to be reflective on, on yourself is very, very important. Uh, if you feel that you don't have the skills that we're talking about now, you know, work on them. Make it a point to work on those types of things. Um, there, there is a billion-dollar industry out there about, lead, about developing leadership skills, and some of it will work and some of it won't. Some of it will resonate with you, some of it won't. But it very much has an effect on everything that goes on in your life. So, um, if you, so go ahead. It really does, Jonathan, and the truth is I'll say anyone who thinks this is fluff, oh, just you can just turn this off right now because I'm going to go even a little bit more out there. The truth <laughs> is, again, I think this is a part of me that I would really have hidden before, and now I just see, you know, the, the truth is I'm not selling anything to anyone right now, and so I get to be as out there as I, as I want to <laughs> be. And um, I, I can say, again, I don't, I don't mean to bring faith into this, but I, there's no way for me to to completely remove it from my practice because there's no way I can re remove the relationship that I have with my father from what I do right now and how I work with dentists. But really what happened for me, and it was like that light bulb moment, and there's no way I can communicate it in a way that, I, but I'll just tell it anyway, is that um, it was like April of 2013. We were still in the midst of trying to transition my dad's practice. Here I am, the 10th of 11 kids, and the truth is things were going really, really bad. Things were really bad. And I just remember feeling like the practice was taking all of my time. It was taking away from my relationship with my husband, away from my two children. And I really didn't see a way that things were going to improve. And I was so fed up. I was fed up with the team. I was fed up with my family. I felt like nobody was trying to make my life easier. As I say, it was a really bad time to be around me. <laughs> it was a really <laughs> bad time to be around me. And I just happened to have this thought. I was holding clothes and going into this whole thing of like, man, my life really is you know, it really stinks, and none of this is even my fault, but I'm so deep in it now, you know, I have to take care of it, and um, I happened to just kind of get this thing of like, you know what, just turn on the TV, and I just happened to turn on the TV as I was folding clothes, and it happened to be a rerun of Oprah that was on at this time, and someone, the person she was interviewing said, please take responsibility for the energy you bring into your space, and that, I, that quote, it hit me so hard. It was this thing of like, Mary Lee, you're not the victim here. Like, take responsibility for your part in this. And that right there changed everything. And so I see dentists over and over again, they're just like, you know what, corporate's coming in and uh, my team doesn't support me and patients are so worried about money. But the truth is we have more power than we realize that we have. And our attitudes and the way that we uh, – the way that we accept perspective, it changes everything. And from April of 2013 on, again, things didn't happen just seamlessly, but over and over again, it was this thing of like, instead of me blaming 
people when things went wrong, it was always just like, okay, what do I need to do differently? And the truth is, at the end of the day, the only people we can really change is, you know, the people we see in the mirror every day, and that's enough. You know, if that's the only mm-hmm. control that we have, that's enough. And so I'm constantly looking at myself, and just as much time as I – my husband even gets around and says it to me because it's so true. He's like, are you working on the business right now or are you working on yourself? Because to me, the two go hand in hand. And I spend just as much time working on myself and looking at, you know, the gaps that I have within myself personally as I do in my business planning. That's like the two go hand in hand. As I'm setting out my goals for the year for 2016, what I want to happen with my business, I'm also setting out those personal goals that are like, okay, in order for that to happen, what needs to happen in me? And, over and I think so many times we think it's just about the numbers and it's just about the business. And I'm trying to tell you it is, but it goes hand in hand with you as a person because the two are just connected in every way. They really are. And, you know, we have, I have a lot of uh, clients will talk to me about employee issues. Uh, and, if you have mm-hmm. empl- and if you have employee issues a lot of the time, um, you know, strengthening your leadership skills can really help solve those problems. Um, and you know, a lot of the times whenever you're trying to figure out this whole, whole leadership things, um, and solving the problems that you have, we all have the, we all have the tendency to kind of internalize what, uh, what's going on from our own perspective. And so that's why I think it's very, very important for a lot of business owners to have actual person they can sound off on these different issues to, to get some outside perspective on what's going on because it's very, very easy to internalize everything and think that you have everything solved. You know what's going on. And then whenever somebody comes in, like my wife is fantastic about this. I'll be thinking about something and I'll just have the my, my blinders on, just tunnel vision going one way. And I'll, I'll, I'll be talking to her about it at dinner and she'll just say one small thing. And I'll just feel like there's like just like a, a lightning bolt hit, hits me in the head. And I'm just like, why didn't I think about that? And it's just because you have somebody else's perspective involved. Um, now, I, I, I have a business coach. Um, Mary Lee was talking to me. Or we were talking earlier how you have a business coach. Uh, yeah. I, we both believe that, that Dennis can, ha- can receive a lot of value by having someone to be able to talk to you about all these different issues. Now, it may not be a coach. It may be a, uh, a someone you graduated dental school with or um, someone who you've had a, has been your mentor for, for years. It may be a, a family member that's a successful business person. It may be somebody. But I think Marilyn and I are both very big on saying that you need somebody to be able to take that type of interest on you. Yes. You need somebody that they're only, more or less, they're only uh, – focus is your growth and development and your success. And I'm not going to say that your classmate or, you know, a mentor doesn't have that, but it's invaluable. And one of the things that I think is still a little bit of a hope, you know, it's still not widely accepted within dentistry is working with a coach. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I, 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 like I said, I work with a business coach. I actually started working with a business coach when I was transitioning my dad's practice. I didn't, make any money working at my dad's practice but again I saw that there were things that needed to happen in me and in order for the practice to transition and so I actually hired a business coach to work with me um, during that time and I paid for that out of my pocket but again it was one of the best investments that I made and it was a huge reason why the transition of the practice went well because there were gaps in me that needed to take place in order for the practice to really um, really go where it needed to go and so what I what I think is it's interesting outside of dentistry, and I'm sure there are other professions, this is the case too, but outside of dentistry and what I've seen, most people are, have no problem admitting the fact that they work with a business coach. But I think dentists still expect there's, there's kind of this rogue, uh, individualistic type mentality within dentistry where people think that they have to do it on their own. And I just want to say if you're, if you're doing it on your own and you're struggling, you're, you're working too hard. If you're doing it on your own, you're, you're working too hard. And um, knowing that you have somebody that's only looking out for you, there's I think there's amazing coaches both within dentistry. There's amazing amazing coaches outside of dentistry. There's no lack of really wonderful people to work with. Absolutely. There, there really isn't. Um, and you can really, really gain a lot of value of having someone else to ask some questions to. Uh, I, I tell a lot of people that being a business owner 
is you have about a thousand small decisions you have to make every day, but you really only have to worry about one or two big decisions to not mess up. Uh, those thousand small decisions, they will work themselves out. Uh, you, can, you can make that decision or you can delegate that decision or you can do a multitude of different things, but there's very few big pitfalls that happen in a business's life. It's, it's, a, it's a lot about getting through the small things, solving the little problems that come up, um, or creating an environment where those problems don't exist. So um, let's talk a little bit about your, the, the, the future of dentistry event uh, and, and what that yeah. is and how that helps out, help, how that helps people. Absolutely. So, okay, so I want to give you the background because, again, it's so, it, it's funny because you and I have had some similar experiences within dentistry. Mm -hmm. I want to tell you first how the Future of Dentistry event came together. And so, as I said, I was going to dental schools and talking to students about, about, I was, I mean, truth, I was there on my own agenda. I was trying to get somebody to come into my dad's practice. And if the answer was, I'm not interested, it was like, okay, I, you know, I can't talk to you right now because that's my, that was my primary focus. But again, I was going, I was um, saying to them, private practice, there's still opportunities within private practice. And so as soon as I transitioned my dad's practice, um, the first thing that I did is I decided to put together, I worked with the dentist that actually took over my dad's practice. She's phenomenal. She's really, really um, has a very strong influence and a very strong drive to help young dentists also. And so we worked together to put together a um more or less a meeting where practicing dentists could mentor these students that were about to graduate and talk to them about, you know, the things that they need to be watching out for in practice and kind of taking them under their wing. So we put together this dinner, and there were about, I think there were about 40 um, dentists and students there. And the whole thought was helping students understand that they still had opportunities within private practice and, you know, they still had opportunities that they should be looking at as they, as they were uh, entering their last year in dental school. And what happened at the dinner is really they just started saying, yeah, I don't know if I would go into dentistry anymore. So much has changed. It took a very negative turn that was like the complete opposite of what I wanted the this dinner and this uh, study club meeting to be. Instead of being like motivating and there, anything possible, it was like, yeah, I just don't think dentistry is a very viable profession anymore. It was something you were actually hearing these dentists that were coming close to retirement saying, like saying that they wouldn't recommend it for their kids and they don't think, you know, it's just too much has changed. And it was a very uh, negative view about dentistry. And so I had these students who I've been saying, yes, private practice is still a completely viable option coming up to me being like, really? You know, like mm -hmm. that's, that was what you had for us? And I was like, guys, no, I promise. I promise it is still a viable option. And I was like, you just have to, you just have, to have the right perspective about it. And so what I decided to do is I reached out to a number of, of um, leaders within dentistry that I had heard or that I had heard great things about and that I respected, and I just asked if I could do an interview with them talking about the future of dentistry. And, you know, a number of them talked about the potential that's still there within private practice, and a few of them really talked about how corporate dentistry is the way to go. The truth is I'm not here to actually show just one vantage point. I am here to say that you have options. You know, and I, mm -hmm. I think it would be wrong to say that private practice is the only way to go. Mm -hmm. The truth is, I like options. And um, and so that's how the Future of Dentistry about, uh, event came to be, was me interviewing a number of leaders within dentistry so that these students did not think that I was just a liar and <laughs> and making up that there were still opportunities within within private practice. And, um, and so then I did that in 2014. I did it earlier this year in 2015, and I'm sure I'll do it at least once a year going forward indefinitely because I really love the opportunity to, to hear different perspectives on what's happening within dentistry. And I can tell you personally, the thing I don't want to have happen to anybody is what happened to me where I kind of was out of the industry for a couple of years. And you see it within, you know, the practicing dentists that do their CER at mine or that they always go to the same study club. But they'll hear this and they, they're kind of like, they're kind of uh, caught off guard with the changes that are happening within dentistry. And I just want it to be a way of, guys, you know, there are changes. You need to be aware of them because if you're aware of them, you can prepare and you don't have to be afraid. You have to be afraid when you just have your head in the sand. Like that's when you're going to get caught off guard and really bad things can happen. But as long as you know what's kind of on the horizon, 
we're all adaptable. And just as you were saying with David and Goliath, the great thing about private practice is that we're actually more um, pliable. We, are, we, can, we can adapt more quickly. I think of the book, it made me think of the book, The Innovator's Dilemma, because mm -hmm. in that book it talks about how what happens with big business and what happens with big corporations is that they can come on the scene and they are able to grow really quickly because they look at business differently. But then as they grow, it actually becomes harder for them to compete because they adapt, it's less, they're, they lack the ability to adapt quickly. And so that is something that I love that you touched on that because the thing that, and I, again, I think that's where it comes down to confidence and leadership. If you know that you can adapt, these things become less scary, that the future is constantly changing. Absolutely. There's always going to be something you can do that's different. I mean, uh, for example, the, the, we had um, uh, Dr. Christopher F uh, Phelps on the show, and he's big on event marketing. Or he calls it, I think he calls it guerrilla marketing. Uh, and he hosts these events every month because he's a, he loves wine, and he hosts an event at his practice every month of a wine and cheese night. And it's for, he just sends invites out to different homeowners associations, sends it out to people that are new to the area, and he says that it brings in so many patients because they come in, he asks these really simple questions of, you know, hey, I, I'm the guy hosting this tonight. I hope everyone's having a good time. Uh, just a quick, you know, show of hands. Who here has been to the dentist in the past? Uh, uh, who here hasn't been to the dentist in the past, past six months? And, you know, a bunch of people raise their hand. You know, he says people don't be scared, et cetera. And he says, okay, of the people here, uh, how, many, how many of you would have gone to the dentist if you had had insurance? And, you know, you know a certain number of the people uh, have, uh, lower their hands. And so at that point, he knows every person in that, that building that doesn't have dental insurance but would go to, a, to, to the dentist. And so he just offers them an in-house dental plan, and he's got all these new patients every month that come into his, his practice because he's very good at asking these types of questions and holding these events. Yes. Uh, and that's something that a corporate practice cannot do because they can't afford to – they're not going to be able to find the, the person that is leading those events to that has the want to have an after hours event to have that's going to be social, that's going to be fun, that's going to have this creativity behind it. Uh, he also talks about how he'll, he'll go to like ret retirement homes and have like um, soda fountain uh, socials or uh, root beer socials for for the retirement homes, just to have you know places for them to have fun and things like that. And he does those things because he likes to do those types of things. You're going to lose yeah. that spark of um, intuition, that spark of creativity with the bigger that you get. Um, and there's always things that you can do to be scrappy and be able to make these things happen. So uh, I think that's a, that's, that's a, a great message. And, um, you know, the – go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say what I love about Dr. Phelps and what he's doing there and is that – um, he, you know, it's like he is doing what he likes and he's doing his, he's doing what comes across as his own strength, right? Like he loves, he's probably someone who loves being social. Like mm -hmm. he loves getting together with people. And so that's, that is one thing is that I feel like dentists oftentimes will be like, you know what, I don't understand this, but it works for my friend. And so now I'm going to start doing it. And that sometimes can be, there's, there's two words of caution that I would have is that one, I will say, say to dentists when they're saying, you know, how should I go about finding a patient? It's like, what do you like to do? Because you're already going to attract people that are like you if you think about the things that you already like to do, whether that's playing sports, whether that's wine and cheese, whether that's, you know, the country club, whatever it may be, you kind of look at, like, you, that, those are the easiest people to convert are the people that are like you. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that I would say is so many times people think, you know, dentists think that they should knock it out of the park their first try. So say that someone puts together their first, you know, wine and cheese event, or I'll talk to someone and say, you know, have you done an event, or have you talked about to a doctor about doing referral sales? These are two examples. Have you ever done like a live event like Dr. Phelps, or have you ever talked to a medical doctor about setting up kind of a referral relationship? And they'll be like, oh yeah, I did that once before and it didn't work. And I'm mm -hmm. just going to say perseverance. Perseverance is such a strong part of being a strong leader because lack of follow through. You know, short attention span is rampant throughout this profession. It's rampant throughout the country. But if you can really say, you know what, this is what I'm going to do for the next year. This is my focus, and I'm going to, damn it, I'm going to get good at it, you know. 
that those are the things that will really change your practice and again change you as a person because you're persevering you get those skills but there's a very uh, strong tendency for people to think okay I tried that once it didn't work I'm never doing that again and I would my word of caution is don't think you're going to knock it out of the park the first time think that you're going to do it better time after time after time there's an old analogy that you don't climb Mount Everest in a day. You don't just one day decide you're going to climb Mount Everest, and then tomorrow you go out and you climb it. It's like a two-year process that you have to become, you have to train, you have to become better at it. You have to, you know, if you were to do it the next day, you would die. You would literally die if you tried to climb Mount Everest the next day. Uh, you may not even make it out of base camp. So um, that anything that's worthwhile the, to do in, in business, anything that's going to create a lot of traction and things like that. Sometimes it takes some effort and some planning and some creativity, uh, which is one of the reasons that I, I really like your message is uh, I'd listened to a webinar that you'd had a while back, and you talked about some really creative things uh, that you do within practices. Uh, and so I, I urge anyone to uh, that's listening now to, 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 to reach out to Marilee and, and be able to uh, kind of, you know, to be able to, to look at some of the things that she produces. She has a great email list. I'm actually pretty envious of, of her emails. Her emails are, are, so, are so good. I, I look at my emails when I send them out. I feel like they're so bad in comparison. Uh, but Marilee is... Oh, uh, that is so not true. That is so not true. Oh, that, that is, uh, Jonathan, that is so nice of you to say. Sometimes I look at it. I, in fact, the email that's going out later this week, because the anniversary of my dad's passing, and the third mm -hmm. anniversary is this week. And I just, again, my dad is in everything that I do. And sometimes I'm like, man, these people are just so patient to put up with me because it... I, I, so a lot of my emails really don't have anything to do with dentistry. I, I feel like, um, and I guess I'm just starting to embrace that a little bit more, is that my message isn't necessarily about dentistry. It just dovetails well with it. I just, you know, dentistry just tend, happens to be the profession where I work, mm -hmm. but it's all about, you know, personal growth. And I, I firmly believe 100% that each of us is here for a reason. Mm -hmm. And that reason isn't just, it isn't just to drill and fill teeth. That reason is to connect with people and touch people, and that's the best thing that happens within dentistry. And again, the more you can touch people and form relationships with people, and there's many different ways to do it, the better your practice becomes and the more fulfilling it is to be there for you and for your team and for your patients. And um, so that's that's why I do what I do. So that's but I, I have to say, honestly, I feel like I'm burying my soul a little bit oftentimes when I send out emails. And I get some really snide replies back to my emails sometimes. <laughs> like, I, I do, and now, you know, it doesn't get under my skin nearly as much. But it's kind of like, why are you sending this to me? And I'm like, I'm sorry. And you know what? Just unsubscribe. Just unsubscribe because, like, if you don't get it, that's okay. Because it, it's just like I can't, I can't help just being who I am. I had a, I sent out, I did this big roundup with all these bankers uh, recently of, you know, all these common questions I was getting about bank loans. And I sent out an email that talked about the, the, the roundup and how all these, these uh, loan people gave all this information, um, put it onto our, uh, and put it on my website. And I got like three emails back when I sent out my emails that said, I already have a bank loan, thanks. And I was just like, that's not what I was trying to do. I was just trying to give you a bank loan. Like, I was just trying to, like, you know, I was trying to tell you that, you know, I spent all this time, energy, and effort, you know, you know, and all these people gave us all this information. Uh, so, yeah, it, uh, that, that's a... Uh you know that 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 that's that's not too important to you, Dennis, out there listening right now. That's just that's kind of kicking kicking it. Uh, but so, look, look. I'm so sorry. I'm probably laughing because I I I'm just, I've just been there before. So I'm sorry. I'm, that is hilarious. That is so funny. Yeah, yeah, I've been there before. That's all I'm saying. Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, so your your um, future dentistry event for 2016 is is going to be sometime. Your, your the next event is going to be sometime in early 2016. Um, that's right. And right now, you actually have the uh, you have twenty two uh, the twenty two interviews that you did in the twenty fifteen event for the future dentistry event uh, are are currently closed right now. Correct. That's right. Because Jonathan, I so admire what you do that you you know I, I kind of focus on one thing and then I shut the doors and I don't you know I move on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. So I love that you are doing these interviews ongoing. I I'm really impressed. And for those of you that are listening, I just want to say, as someone who does interviews, this is quite the undertaking. And so I hope that you do show your appreciation to Jonathan because this is huge. I, I appreciate you interviewing me, and I, I also can appreciate it because I know 
I know the work that goes in on the back end. So thank you so much for doing this, Jonathan. I think it's such a great benefit. Um, but yeah, when I do my interviews, I make them available for about a month, and then I close them um, so that they're not available anymore. And so what I was saying is anyone who's listening that would like to hear those 22 interviews will just um, provide the password to that, to that page. And so, Jonathan, do you mind telling people how they can get that? Is that all right? Since yeah, I'm absolutely. Going to let you take, take the reins on that. Thank uh, you. Absolutely. So the, the way that you can get that password uh, is that just uh, text the word practice. That's P-R-A-C-T-I-C-E, if I remember how to spell the word practice, uh, to 33444. That's practice to 33444. Uh, if you, or if you're outside of the U.S., you can go to startyourdentalpractice.com slash bonus and we'll be able to send that straight to your to your inbox to show you how to be able to access those uh, 22 interviews that Marilee has been very, very gracious to be able to share with us. Um, and as you said, 22 interviews, I'll be honest, whenever I was, uh, when, when I was starting the, the podcast, I thought it'd be easier to get interview, interviewees. Uh, and I've found that there's a lot of interviewees that don't want to be, you know, have these casual conversations like we're having now because they, they, they don't want to uh, be, be put on record saying anything. So you, you said you appreciate me. I really appreciate you coming on. Everyone out there, I appreciate uh, you listening in. Uh, if anyone wants to reach out to you, Marilee, what's a good way for them to be able to reach out to you? You know what? The best way for them to reach out to me, and I'm sorry because my name is a little bit complicated, is just um, my name, which is Marilee Sears. Um, I'll spell it for you if you want. M-A-R-I-L-E-E. E A R S at gmail dot com. That's my that's my favorite way for people to reach out to me, um, and so that's that's probably the best way. Fantastic. Well, Marley, thank you so much for giving us your time today, and thank you so much for what you're doing in dentistry. The the future of dentistry event's a great event, and like you said, it's a it's a big undertaking to get everything uh, going in it. So I really appreciate you and everyone out there. Have a great day. Hey, so I really enjoyed my chat with Mary Lee today, and I hope that you had some takeaways like I did. So a special thanks to Mary Lee for spending time with us today. Uh, and again, those interviews that Mary Lee does are invaluable to those wanting to get ahead the right way in the dental industry, and they're a really great picture of what's happening in the industry today. So to get the secret password to those interviews, simply text PRACTICE to 33444. Again, that's PRACTICE to 33444 or visit startyourdentalpractice.com slash bonus if you're outside of the U.S. and you'll be able to get those. Also, just as a side note to leave you on, Marilee sends out some of the best emails. Uh, I always read them and I smile at the end because they're so genuine and you can tell that she does such a good job with those. So uh, I highly recommend jumping on her list. Uh, so at some point in time, check her out, go to her, th- her, her site and listen to her. She has some great ideas about the, in- the dental industry. So that's it for today's episode, but that doesn't mean that the learning and implementation have to stop there. I've created a free report called the 15 numbers that will make or break your dental practice. This report has been downloaded over a thousand times by dental professionals. So if you want your free copy of this report, that's going to outline what the most important numbers are in any dental practice. And it also includes how to look at your numbers, how to set goals, has a whole slew of really important information that is the culmination of all of my experience as a dental dental CPA, then just go to startyourdentalpractice.com slash free gift. That is startyourdentalpractice.com slash free gift. And so that's it for today, Ambitious Dentist. Again, I'm Jonathan Van Horn, CPA and ABV. I'll see you next week with another world-class practice owner or consultant that will help you start your very own dental practice. Thank you guys so much for being a part of the Start Your Dental Practice community. If you enjoyed today's episode, please do me a favor and go to startyourdentalpractice.com slash iTunes to leave your honest feedback and review on iTunes. It's going to help me create a better experience, a better show, a better podcast, for you, the ambitious dentist, your feedback really does help. Regardless if you like the show today or not, if you didn't like the show, let me know because it's going to help me create a better show and podcast for you. Lastly, if you know of anybody that would benefit from today's episode and today's content, today's guest, please feel free to share with them on social media 
or through email.